Kalashnath Adhikari, Managing Director, Governors Now, Shri Adhikari Brothers Enterprise. And today I'm being joined by none other than Mr. Kamal Sibbalji, former Indian for, former, uh, Foreign Secretary. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, sir. So, you know, we all come, have come to know about the recent Afghanistan crisis and the way the entire political situation in Afgan Afghanistan has changed. My first question to you is, you know, that what is the impact of the change of hands that has happened in Afghanistan on the world polity? If you uh, take the world politics, a nation, a crucial nation, um, suddenly a change of hands happening. What is the influence or the impact that it could have on the world politics? Well, firstly, I don't think Afghanistan is a crucial nation. Uh, there are many more <laughs> crucial nations in the world. So let's not exaggerate the importance of uh, Afghanistan. Yes, it has geopolitical significance. Yes. Uh, became uh, very useful. Well, it has a complicated history during the time when the British were ruling India and the Russian Empire was expanding. So it became crucial in that sense uh, as a struggle between two empires. And then when the Soviets invaded uh, Afghanistan, uh, during the Cold War. So it became crucial in that sense as a kind of confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union played out in Afghanistan. And um, you know the history of uh, United States uh, actually mobilizing Islam mm -hmm. and Jihad against the Soviets. Uh, if you remember Brzezinski's uh, take on this, that uh, uh, Central Asia was the soft underbelly of the Soviet Union. So the idea was to confront the Soviet Union, not only on the European front, but also from the Asian front, Central Asian mm. front. So it became crucial in that sense as a struggle between two Cold War titans. Mm. And then uh, the terrorism raised this ugly head, which the United States was not particularly active in fighting against until the... Uh, attacks on the United States, September 11 attacks. And then, uh, uh, let me put it somewhat differently. This terrorism business of war on terror was a project actually to, for regime change in the Middle East. Uh, Afghanistan was not in the picture until, of course, 9-11 ha ha happened. Osama bin Laden was involved. Osama bin Laden was hiding in, uh, had shelter in, uh, Afghanistan, which was ruled by the Taliban, and apparently the Taliban were not ready to hand him over uh, to the Americans. And the Americans, uh, since they had to somehow find some kind of, uh, uh, of country which would be ready for U.S. retribution about what, <laughs> because of what happened in 9-11. So they attacked uh, uh, Afghanistan and got rid of the Taliban regime. I remember, they were actually quite happy to deal with the Taliban regime. In fact, the UNO call pipeline uh, mm. was be, uh, was being uh, uh, promoted at that time, and the U.S. State Department, Robin Rafel, were very much involved uh, involved in that until this episode of Osama uh, bin Laden happened. Uh, and then the Taliban uh, were uh, thrown out uh, of Afghanistan with the help of the Northern Alliance. Now, it has become uh, crucial in the sense that the United States uh, continued this uh, engagement in, uh, with, uh, with, in Afghanistan for the last 18 years. Hmm. We're, not, we're not able to uh, counter uh, the terrorism unleashed by the Taliban on the ground. Uh, and began to suffer casualties, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, to, to cut a long story short, because then we'll go into the history of what happened. Uh, there was no way that the United States could win this war on terror in Afghanistan unless they dealt with Pakistan. The Soviets, I believe, the Soviets had told them that you will never win, your, win the war in Afghanistan unless you d deal with the safe havens in Pakistan, which mm -hmm. for whatever reason the United States didn't want to do. Hmm. At the end of the day, uh, from their point of view, quite rightly, after having spent, as they say, $1 trillion and lost uh, hmm. so many uh, people, 4,000 and more casualties in Afghanistan, they decided to withdraw. But, but and that's the central point. 
Mm-hmm. What have they done? They have handed over the country to the very group that mm-hmm. they fought for eighteen years. Absolutely, and it's totally against all the principles and uh, uh, and values that the United States uh, has uh, tried to mm-hmm. uh, try to actually spread internationally as mm-hmm. a matter of policy. It's part of their inherent democratic mm-hmm. uh, human rights ideology, and they have handed over the country uh, to a group which doesn't at all share any of the values of the United States. First mm-hmm. of all, it is contradictory in terms of the war on terror because this is a terror group. It's against their democratic values because they have handed over power to this group with, mm-hmm. without democratic process, without mm-hmm. going through an electoral process. Mm-hmm. They have actually gone ahead and legitimized this group by talking directly uh, to it. You know, gender equality, women's rights are very powerful issues uh, mm-hmm. in Western societies. And here they have handed over the country to a group which doesn't believe in those in, kind in, of, any of them. Human rights and et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Or human rights in, in, in general. Uh, so it is a tragedy uh, for the international community that mm-hmm. the United States uh, has chosen uh, to hand over the country. The country. Uh, to, to, to the Taliban, and it is going to have uh, serious repercussions uh, all around in the region, but so globally. Sure. Now, you know, we are living, uh, Kavalji, in the era of globalization, where, as you rightly mentioned, gender equality, uh, the rights of women, as well as uh, a need for uh, uh, an evolving society is all now the basic norm. What does it mean, you know, to the world that in the era of such a globalization where democracy is rules the roost, a nation has succumbed to one sort of tyranny? I mean, this is like a tyranny rule. Well, I would like to nuance that a bit, uh, because uh, while it is true that the United States uh, is the torchbearer for uh, democracy and human rights and everything else, uh, I don't think that there are there are other countries in the world who accept or subscribe uh, to the manner in which the United States projects itself as a democracy and as mm-hmm. a supporter of human rights. There is obviously the issue of double standards. Mm-hmm. There's always been there that countries which have been close to the United States for geopolitical reasons uh, are not targeted on human rights issues. And I don't want to name countries, but Pakistan is a clear case in question. Mm-hmm. If you look at West policy towards Pakistan and India, you can easily see that the uh, United States has not given all these years a- any value to India as a democracy mm. and has supported the Pakistan military. Mm. Uh, so, therefore, in, in, in a larger sense, we can uh, relate to United States' commitment for demo- to democracy because we are a democracy ourselves. Mm. Uh, but practical terms, in terms of the application of those principles in our region and beyond, or for that matter, in the Middle East. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, the fact that the United States has this agenda of democracy gen- resonates with us to the extent that it should. Other than that, you have China. The mm. United States uh, has very strong relations with China. In fact, United States has built up China over the years into mm. the kind of monster that it has become today. Mm. And know well that it is a authoritarian regime. Authoritarian is a mild word. Actually, it is a kind of a totalitarian uh, regime. And uh, uh, and Xi Jinping has now unveiled China's ambitions very clearly. And But the uh, uh, United States still deals with China. It still mm-hmm. has a booming trade relationship with China. Uh, look, at, look at Russia. Uh, Russia doesn't fit into this uh, description of uh, a globalized democratic world. It has a personality of its own, policies of its own, commitments of its own, role of its own. Uh, and then there are a whole lot of countries in Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, who don't fit into any description of a globalized democracy. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't like to exaggerate, mm-hmm. exaggerate uh, uh, this point. Nevertheless, nevertheless, having uh, nuanced all that, uh, if a choice has to be made between uh, United States democracy and Chinese uh, authoritarianism. Uh, I think uh, most of the world uh, would uh, would tend to uh, be more in tune uh, with uh, the kind of uh, uh, globalized world world based on certain values which you outline. Mm. 
uh, would be the preferred option uh, mm. rather than a China dominated world which is opaque, uh, where you don't know how policy is made, where there is no uh, uh, freedom of press, uh, where, uh, in fact, if you see what China is doing in Tibet and, and Xinjiang, uh, where they are, uh, they, they are trying to they are trying to, in fact, uh, make them Han Chinese by suppressing their yeah. and uh, and linguistic rights, etc., uh, etc. Et Therefore, uh, uh, I think on the whole, uh, the U.S. Uh, let, let, let me then add to this. That is the reason why countries like India mm. are. are are asking for a reform of the international institutions, both political and economic. Because mm. far too long, the West has dominated these institutions and set the agenda. Mm. And countries like India, which are democratic, mm. uh, should have a right uh, to uh, influence that agenda, steer that agenda in, in terms of more democratic equality uh, between uh, countries. Unfortunately, China has not begun to dem dominate mm. the UN is the second largest uh, provider of funds to the, U to the UN system. And India, as a democratic country, uh, is, is not able to uh, exercise its weight uh, in mm. terms of shaping the global environment. The global environment is either being shaped by the West or mm. was in case for a couple of centuries shaped by them and after the Second World War certainly shaped by them uh, almost uh, uniquely. And now China is posing a challenge and trying to shape the global environment in terms of its own thinking uh, and policies. And they have now offered their model as a better model uh, for developing countries, better political and economic development model. But India is not able yet to find its, uh, find its place because the United States uh, and the other countries actually don't want uh, mm -hmm. a financial, uh, uh, the form of the United Nations uh, Security Council yeah. of that matter, the World Bank and the IMF, because that's where uh, they ex exerted their power. And the other countries too, although they support uh, India's mem permanent membership of the Security Council, but in China, uh, I think it is more in terms of lip service, knowing fully well that uh, this is not going to happen. Absolutely. <laughs> not going to have a foreseeable uh, future. Uh, so uh, uh, to answer your question, uh, I think uh, Afghanistan is, is not terribly relevant in this mm -hmm. context, even if the Taliban has taken over, because there are far more serious challenges to a globalized democratic world which are emerging. Other than Afghanistan. From China. From China. <laughs> China. Sure. Now, India, uh, as you rightly know, Kamalji has maintained a wait and watch stand. According to you, what has prompted it to do so? Now, considering the fact that also, you know, uh, we have sizable trade relationship with Afghanistan. What will be the trade and economic impact now with the Taliban taking over and why the wait and watch stand? First of all, we don't have much of a trade uh, relationship with uh, Afghanistan. I, I can't really uh, recall the figures, but it's, it, it is probably $500 million or something. Somewhere around like 700, 800 million. Okay, seven, eight hundred million million, which is nothing. Which is nothing at all in terms of... Uh, our trade with uh, key countries. Mm. Uh, we are not going to get, uh, we are not going to have an opportunity uh, to invest in uh, Afghanistan in a big way because it will need stability, in, in long term stability in Afghanistan. And certainly under the Taliban, uh, one can't count on that. Uh, and then infrastructure has to be built in a very big way to be able to extract. Uh, uh, go into mining and extract uh, mineral resources uh, in collaboration with the uh, with the Afghans. Uh, that also is not a prospect that uh, that uh, that is uh, visible on the horizon. Um, uh, whereas the trade is is in our favor. Uh, we import dry fruit and uh, fresh fruit from Afghanistan, but that's not critical for our economy. Uh, mm. Afghanistan not, is not a country which is going to give us uh, high technology or <laughs> give us high defense, uh, boost up our defense capabilities and this and that. So therefore, we should not exaggerate the importance of Afghanistan. It is, it is important only in the sense that uh, uh, it is in our region. It is a member mm -hmm. of SAR. It's a member of 
every right to be in Afghanistan as, as in any other country. And Pakistan has been long opposing this and clearly saying that they, they don't want India to be present in Afghanistan, that India has no role in Afghanistan. And they have these absurd views that India's missions in Afghanistan are larger than are required. And I asked the question then, uh, how come Pakistan has such a large mission in Nepal or in Sri Lanka when Pakistan is not contiguous with these countries? That's yeah. their argument. That since India is, not, India is not contiguous with Afghanistan, there's no justification for having such a large diplomatic presence. Yeah. Therefore, actually, if you stress this idiotic uh, logic more, uh, India should have a very, very small mission in the United States because it is at the other end of the globe. It is the farthest away from us geographically and we have no contiguity. So why should we have a large mission in, in the United States or for that matter, Pakistan should have? Uh, so uh, the... Uh, Not much of a relevance. That's why the wait and watch stand. No, therefore, uh, no, it is important in the sense that uh, in, 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 term to ha- in terms of having some kind of a regional balance, hmm. uh, not allow Pakistan to dominate uh, uh, Afghanistan hmm. and uh, block all prospects of, uh, of Afghanistan having an opening to the, the world which would uh, allow it to develop and be sovereign and exercise uh, its right to bring prosperity to its people. And then, of course, it is a link between... Uh, India and Central Asia. So we've yeah. been trying to uh, gain entry into Afghanistan through Chabahar, uh, mm. through it, so that from there we can have easier access to Afghanistan mm. and to, to Central Asia. And it is a right to do so. It mm. is a right to do so. And uh, India should play its role in terms of shaping the regional environment. <laughs> now we are a member of SCO, mm. uh, where we uh, we obviously try to uh, introduce uh, ideas and, uh, and pursue objectives which uh, serve our uh, interests. Uh, uh, but the huge problem is of lack of access uh, to, to Afghanistan. So yes, only in terms of regional balance is important. But, but beyond that, uh, mm-hmm. one more issue which is important, which is terrorism. Yes. In, uh, Pakistan has used Afghan territory to train mm. uh, terrorists, elite terrorists, uh, JEM, Jaisi Muhammad terrorists, and send them into uh, mm. Kashmir. And the Taliban has been complicit in this. You know the IC-814 uh, incident. Uh, now, there could be concern that uh, Pakistan and the Taliban may join hands uh, to put some pressure in uh, Jammu Recently, and Pakistan made an announcement and I, I was about to come to that and as you rightly you know, pointed out that we would seek the help of Taliban and this is there in, uh, in the media and the Pakistani media as early as yesterday evening or today morning that we will seek the help of Taliban to recapture Kashmir. Well, this is one of the members of uh, Imran Khan's party, the lady mm-hmm. who, who said that and she incarnates uh, total stupidity. And I think she was... Uh, uh, quite effectively rebutted by one of our own colleagues in mm. that uh, television show because he said, then what is the Pakistan army for? Mm. <laughs> if the Pakistan army can't handle Kashmir, handle India, do you think the Taliban are going to do it for you? Uh, mm. And on, he asked, are you assuming that the Taliban want to play that role? Mm. So, uh, yes, these loose statements can come, but Pakistan will take a tremendous risk after Balakot, where we have, sh- we have indicated to them, shown to them, that we will not easily tolerate uh, their in stepping up terrorist activities in Jammu and Kashmir. Now, if they do so, if they utilize the elements of the Afghan Taliban or whatever to step up terrorist activity in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, since there's no contiguity between Afghanistan and India, it has to come through Pakistan. So Pakistan would be totally involved in this. And now that everybody is aware of Pakistan's role in uh, promoting terrorism in the region, and I'll just come to something else in this regard, mm. uh, and it's under watch by the FATF. If, mm. he gets, if, it, if it actually starts promoting terrorism in, uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, it will not be able to, uh, to uh, uh, forestall in fact, it will be, become far more vulnerable in terms of international pressure. 
uh, in the yeah. now as you know in the g7 uh, foreign affairs committees uh, statement that was made before the g7 uh, met in, in a virtual meeting uh, there was there was clear reference to cross border terrorism and uh, to uh, make sure that the taliban do not get involved in terrorism in south asia mm. Not, the Taliban are not going to promote terrorism in Pakistan. <laughs> they are going to or in Sri Lanka or in Bangladesh uh, mm. or in Nepal or Bhutan is India. So the reference was <laughs> India, uh, and the G7 uh, statement itself also uh, talks about uh, um, you know, keeping a close eye on uh, on uh, the Taliban and its activities and whether they live up to its commitments that they will not allow their territory to be used for terrorism against any other country. So, I think uh, that issue of terrorism is there, mm. uh, but in a different way, in the sense that Pakistan itself has got radicalized, and if there is such an obscurantist radical force in uh, in Afghanistan, which uh, is basking in the glory that they have defeated another superpower, then the uh, how should I say? Then the atmosphere in the region uh, changes. And uh, there's much greater uh, value put on using uh, the mm. tools of terrorism and Islamic radicalism uh, to fight their battles. And, and organizations, the other organizations get encouraged. Mm. And they are not part of any uh, international structure. They have no stake in the international system. They can take risks mm. and ignite something. So that is what uh, our concern is. And therefore, we need to make sure that our defenses in Jammu and Kashmir remain very strong, which, mm-hmm. which uh, they are and are improving. And finally, I would say if we can stand up to China, we can surely stand up to these uh, rag, <laughs> ragtag uh, gun-toting fellows. Naturally. Now, talking about the dragon, you know, the dragon has sort of recognized the Taliban rule. Is it eyeing this territory as it did Pakistan and Sri Lanka with major investments in a bid to corner India? I don't think uh, if they did that, the idea would be to corner India. Uh, the, their game plan is much larger uh, to dominate the Asian landmass and then challenge the United States. And they have laid out their timelines as to when they're going to achieve that. And by 2049, which mm-hmm. is the under of the founding of the uh, of the uh, Chinese uh, uh, Chinese uh, Communist China. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they hope to be either equal to the United States in terms of international governance or be uh, the preeminent power. They have said that in, in, in as many words. So this is part of that. Now, the, the most important tool that they have in their hand is the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, hmm. which intends to create a, 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 a system, an economic system, uh, which will make all the countries who are part of the BRI dependent on China. So like in the past, all roads led to Rome. So this time, all roads will lead to Beijing. Mm. And these countries that they're targeting need investment. They need infrastructure. Uh, they are not able to uh, meet the criteria that the World Bank or the IMF will lay down for bankable projects. But China has geopolitical aims. They are, they are willing to do projects which are not economically sustainable, mm. uh, but create political constituencies uh, for themselves mm. as part of their larger geopolitical aim of, uh, of uh, competing with the, uh, the United States. And Afghanistan will fit into this mm. because already dominating Central Asia, the oil supplies, gas supplies from Central Asia are now going to China. Mm. Uh, they are uh, they have made Pakistan into a virtual colony. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I say so. And if they can bring Afghanistan uh, into this, and with their 20 year agreement with Iran, mm. and with the access to the Arabian Sea they have through Gwada, they, they are in a very, very uh, uh, strong position uh, to extend uh, their ge- geopolitical uh, weight. Uh, and uh, make many of these countries even more and more dependent uh, on on China. We are a collateral damage of this. Mm. It's not 
not as if uh, the policy is axed on cornering India. The policy is axed on challenging the United States. But in the process, uh, naturally, our role and our weight, uh, natural weight in this region. Uh, mm -hmm. The answer to that is our Indian Navy and maritime security, quad uh, mm -hmm. Indo Pacific, an area where China does not dominate and is weak and is vulnerable. Therefore, we have to balance that uh, by actually going ahead and boosting uh, mm -hmm. our naval uh, capabilities in partnership uh, with others. Uh, um, and, but of course, Afghanistan is not part of that. It's a landlocked country. Mm, absolutely. Now, talking about Russia, it has firmly maintained the stand that it won't engage with Taliban. India and Russia, to that extent, have opened a, a hotline dialogue for this specially. What significant does it hold? Russia, <clears throat> Russia is engaging the Taliban. <clears throat> in, in fact, uh, uh, Russian policy is somewhat difficult to understand uh, because they have uh, batted for the Taliban. They have recognized them as a legitimate political force. They have uh, set up a lot of uh, groups uh, involving the, uh, the, the Taliban to try and promote a, uh, a this, this reconciliation process and a political negotiated solution by bringing all parties together because Russia has certain uh, security responsibilities with regard to Central Asia. They, you have the CSDO, uh, which is a security organization led by Russia. Currently, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan are not members but mm. Tajik, the uh, fulcrum of this. Yeah. And they are worried uh, that uh, the spillover from Afghanistan, the radicalization, and the Chechen fighters who are part of the ISIS and all that, that this may actually then spill over into Russia proper. And therefore, they want to control it and combat it. And they want to get the cooperation of Pakistan in trying to stop this. And dealing directly with China, with the Taliban, as China has done, to make sure that uh, uh, they can safeguard their interests in that direction. Uh, knowing fully well that uh, this is at odds with India's concerns and policies. In fact, both the United States, after all, their entire policy in Afghanistan doesn't take into cognizance at all India's security interests. They yeah. handed Afghanistan to Pakistan and given knowing Pakistan's search for strategic depth against India and Afghanistan. Mm. And I, of course, had done that, but China is not our friend. But Russia is also doing the same thing. Uh, mm. All is our friend. Uh, but bilaterally, uh, they keep, they, we, are, we are in a dialogue with them as we are with the United States. But Russia, to my mind, from their point of view, they want to protect their own interests and expect India to look after his own, his own interests. So there is, there is this gap in, mm -hmm. in thinking with regard to the Taliban. But all is not lost because after what happened uh, yesterday, the terrible terrorist attacks. In Kabul, uh, yes. In, in Kabul. Uh, this is a sign of the times of what, is lying, what lies ahead. I heard. And uh, therefore, we may find slowly more common ground with Russia to try mm -hmm. and work together to stem the kind of challenges that one can foresee emanating from Afghanistan. Sure. Now, you know, Joe Biden, upon the recent attack of Kabul airport, which was yesterday, said that the attackers of Kabul airport won't be spared. We will come and we'll hunt them down. Now, does this statement hold any relevance, knowing the fact that, you know, 31st August, they have to retreat? Well, as I said in an article which I wrote yesterday, the Taliban... Uh, have withstood, have withstood the bite of the United States, so they can easily withstand its bark. I mean, uh, they're retreating uh, and they decided to quit Afghanistan and not to come back mm. and not engage in forever wars. And they have no presence on the ground. And in fact, they're seeking protection of the Taliban in terms mm. of events. Mm. So how are they going to, uh, what means do they have uh, to chase these fellows. Do they expect that uh, the Taliban will cooperate with them um, mm. to identify who these people are and mm. then allow them to uh, uh, deal with these people and eliminate them? I don't think the Taliban uh, will do that. In fact, I don't even 
I'm not even convinced that it is ISIS. It may be. I, I'm not saying that I have some information which says that it is not mm. ISIS. Because all these fellows are, are uh, birds of the same feather. Mm. Uh, they're between them. Uh, and it is very convenient uh, even for the Taliban or elements within the Taliban to create this uh, impression that there is a group called ISIS which is working independently with which they have nothing to do, which is responsible for these terrorist attacks and therefore to shed any blame falling on them. Uh, mm. At the same time, uh, teaching the departing Americans a lesson, a further humiliation and, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, putting them in a position where in fact, they have no immediate good choice mm. because if, uh, if Biden were to react now, Mm. Uh, the, the entire evacuation process would get derailed and the Taliban uh, could actually step up uh, their terrorist attacks. Therefore, he can't actually uh, pinpoint the blame on the Taliban, which mm. is what is happening, saying, no, no, the Taliban are cooperating. It is ISIS and this and that. So in this, this is a murky situation. I don't know where the truth is, mm. but, but the long and uh, short is that uh, uh, I hope the Americans get to them mm. uh, for everybody's sake. But how they will get, uh, will they have uh, intelligence on the ground? Will Taiwan cooperate with them? Will Pakistan cooperate with them? Uh, mm. I, 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 I don't think. Uh, uh, and will they, will they engage in special operations uh, as they did in Syria and elsewhere in an unfavorable ground where the country is hostile to them? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, now, my last question, uh, Kamal ji, that would the continuation of the Republican rule in U.S. made some difference or could no, have any different outcome? The Doha agreement was signed by Trump. It was, mm -hmm. uh, Khalilzad was appointed by Trump, not by Biden. And Biden keeps repeating this point, although he, he overturned many, of other, many other policies of uh, Trump. But this time he didn't. Pick, this, this one he didn't because... Uh, he also believes that uh, America should end this war, uh, which in some senses, uh, from the American point of view, is right. Uh, if 18 years have passed, you've not been able to deal with the situation. You've not been able to do any nation building. Mm. Uh, look at the in which the, which the Afghan army just melted away. It's mm. totally wasted effort. Uh, so... Uh, uh, I don't think uh, Trump, who had committed to his electorate that he will end the war in Afghanistan, would have done any, anything different. Okay, if it was a question of uh, some military action on the ground against whom? Against, against uh, Taliban, with whom they were negotiating. They could have been, they could have been more bluster on the part of Trump, uh, but I, I don't think that... Uh, Materially, anything would have changed uh, under the Republican administration because the United States is, is caught in a very, very difficult situation. Once you have announced that you're going to leave, and the public mm -hmm. opinion wants that, and, and even the U.S. Power, the, the 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 people of U.S. I mean, the public at large want they that. Want, they, they want. want they, they want withdrawal, and when they don't want more more casualties, you th when you think this is a wasteful uh, effort, when you've committed this to your uh, electorate. It, it, is, it is the manner in which uh, this has been done rather precipitately by mm -hmm. Biden, which is being criticized, even, even in the United States. Not so much uh, the fact of withdrawal, but the manner of withdrawal uh, mm -hmm. that is that being criticized. Uh, and the acceleration of the timetable of withdrawal, announcing by September 11 we leave, and then saying by August 31 we will leave, which has resulted in the problems on the ground of evacuation and everything else that we uh, that we see, um, mm. but uh, I don't think uh, uh, if Trump had continued, uh, there would have been any. There would have been any different situation. With that, thank you so much, Kamal Sibalji, for joining us on this episode of History Talks by Governors Now. It was certainly a pleasure hosting you, sir, today uh, this evening on the show. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for also joining us. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.